Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Hope everyone is doing well. Looking forward to sharing with you all this morning. Just hang tight as people uh, begin to log on. And we're just going to give people a minute or so to, to join us. So just hang tight. everyone everyone logged on waiting for people to join us this morning all right I see people getting on right now just people taking a minute or so just hang tight and we will get started in just a minute Merry um, Western Christmas some people get offended if you say Merry Christmas on the wrong date so <laughs> Merry Western Christmas um, and almost Happy New Year. We are almost done with 2021. Hip, hip, hooray. Hope everybody is praying for that day that we can close the end of 2020 and start 2021. All right, everyone. Just uh, hang tight. People are logging in as we speak. All right. We are continuing our series. Um called The I Kings of Christ. And we are on our fourth week studying the different reasons why Christ told us he is coming to the earth. He said, I came that they may have life. And he says, I came for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He also said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So we're studying in this in these few weeks all the reasons that the, the Lord came. So now that I see everybody's logged in, we can get started in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, so excited to continue sharing in this series because I love reflecting on, on, on this theme specifically because it needs to stir us up from within to know exactly why Christ has come and what Christ came to do for you and for me and how he came to save all of us. I pray that we would really um, use these verses and these messages so that we would know how to learn how to reflect and we would learn how to enjoy this season. So turn with me, your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, to Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. All right. Today is going to be a different type of verse that maybe when you read it, it doesn't sound like it came from Jesus. It's too hard to assume, like it would be impossible to assume that this came from Jesus because it doesn't sound like him. It doesn't sound like something Jesus would say. Turn your Bibles with me. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. He says this. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Okay, that, that seems like Christ is being effective on that, like when we see people turning against their in-laws, okay? And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Lord Jesus, why are you saying this? This doesn't sound like anything that you would possibly say. It doesn't sound like you. It doesn't, you know, like it doesn't match anything else that we know about you, Lord. You are the one that came to bring peace and you're the one that came to bring peace on earth. How is it that you're telling us you did not come to bring peace, but a sword? How strange it is that the Prince of Peace states that he came not to bring peace. Another place he tells his disciples, he told uh, uh, Peter, who has no, he said, he, or he told the disciples, he says, let him who has no sword sell his mantle and buy one. At the end of Christ's life, he told the disciples, go and sell what you have to go buy a sword. What is this? Why is the Lord changing his tone and teaching us something that really doesn't match his whole message of love? Turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 verses 52 to 53. It says this, And this same Jesus told Peter when he had drawn his sword to protect him. Peter had drawn his sword after he cut off uh, Malchus's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
He draw his sword to protect him. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? That's the Jesus I know. That's the Jesus that I, that I can assume said, you know, like, please put away your sword. But today we're studying the verse in Matthew chapter 10 where it says, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. What does this mean? When we read scriptures, we have to take things in its context. We can't take the word of God out of its context. What does he say? After he says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. If you're looking, join me. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. He says, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. You see, in the early years of Christianity, Christ literally came with a sword and he was splitting families because the people, maybe a wife that followed Christ, was put away by her husband. Her husband divorced her or kicked her out and got rid of her because she started to follow Christ. Or um, believing husbands might have been um, left by their wives. And so you could imagine that Christ was actually splitting families. You say, Lord, why are you doing this to your people? And we're going to understand what is this sword that Christ came to bring? You see, Christ brought a dividing sword of hostility. And we're going to talk about this type of hostility that is created by Christ in our lives. Christ creates this, this um, discomfort, this inner tension within us. And I want us to understand and benefit from the sword and follow the sword that Christ came to bring. Again, it doesn't sound like the typical gospel of Jesus, where Jesus did not come to bring swords. We're against religions that bring swords and encourage swords. How could we be having this? Let's, let's dig a little bit deeper. You see, Christians had to be prepared to love Jesus more than even their own families. You see, when they were following Christ, they had to make some difficult choices of realizing that they're going to have to say goodbye to their families. We have converts from Islam today that today know that as soon as they accept Christ, they may never see their family again. Even their family might want to kill them, might want to um, strike them down with the sword. And so you say, I kind of understand that Christ's sword is a different sword. It's not a physical sword. It's not a sword that draws blood. But it is a sword that creates division. How many of you have experienced this sword that in following Christ, it took away the peace between you and some of your friends? Maybe some of your friends aren't followers of Christ and they don't want to be followers of Christ and they don't want you to be a follower of Christ. And so Christ relationship, your relationship with Christ has brought a sword where it has divided this relationship between you and others. Maybe your parents don't like how super committed you are to your faith. You, you know, you're, you're, maybe you're uptight now and you're not as, as easygoing as you used to be. That's the sword. Listen to what John says, because darkness hates light. You see, darkness hates light. And the Antichrist has come to destroy Christ. And so Christ came to bring a sword to separate us from the world. It's so hard to accept that I'm preaching right now about the sword of Christ, but it is a different sword. Let's look at it. John chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. Can you follow with me? John chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. He says this, And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Isn't that so true that when Christ brings light to our life, darkness hates it. And so there is a sword, there is a division. There's no peace between us and darkness. Even St. Paul says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Light and darkness cannot meet. 
unless light is shining through darkness to convert the darkness to light. But again, darkness hates light. Everything that is anti-Christ is against Christ. And so when Christ says, I came to bring a sword. I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. We want to understand what is this sword? You see, the light that Jesus brings has to disturb those who live in darkness and in evil. It has to disturb them. It has to create a hostility. The light that is in you has to create a hostility between you and the world. And the world hates you as a believer. Hates you for following the laws of God and the commandments of God. It's just not politically correct anymore to be a Christian, right? Because there are laws that God established on this earth. There are laws that God established. Physical laws, natural laws. And here, it is not easy. It is not easy to be in the path of light because darkness hates it. Darkness says, get revenge. Darkness says, get your own right. You know, defend yourself. But light says, turn the other cheek. You see, there, there's a clashing. There is a sword here. First thing I want to talk about is the sword of conviction. Doesn't the presence of Christ also cause a disturbance inside you? That when you grow closer to the Lord Jesus, you feel this turmoil inside of you. You feel something pulling you to the path of sin. You feel something pulling you away from, from, from Christ and, and light. Right, Something that says, no, indulge in your pleasures. Do what you want. Don't let anyone control you. Why should you obey somebody? Be your own person. Obedience no longer is, is something that is like looked upon highly in society. Right? It's No one can tell me what to do. Isn't that kind of like the spirit of today's age? And so, once again, the sword of Christ brings this conviction that says, look, I have to wrestle within myself. I'm having a war within myself between what is right and what is wrong. Between what honors Christ. Between what honors Christ and what dishonors Christ. I have this war inside of me and you have this war. And that is the same sword that Christ came to bring. God does not want you to be at peace with sin. God does not want you to be at peace with what is wrong. You see, in God's presence, our masks fall off. In God's presence, the, the image that you're trying to portray to the world of, of, of that you have everything together, when you meet Christ in your inner room, when you're praying, your masks fall off. And you have to be real. And there's this war because you hate yourself. You hate things within yourself. You hate um, certain feelings and discomfort that you feel. Christ came to bring a sword. Don't we feel these internal battles going on in the presence of Jesus? That when you're one way in the world and then you come before Christ and you want to hide yourself because you, you, you're ashamed. You know that there's a conflict between the way of Christ and the way of the world. The world that tells you to, to enjoy in sin, enjoy in, in pleasure, and to indulge and to live however you want to live. No, I am the servant of Christ. Something in me tells me, no, serve yourself. And another part of me tells me, serve Christ. St. Paul talks about this. It's this balance, this, this, this battle between the flesh and the spirit. The spirit says to, to draw closer to Christ and to, to remove those, those selfish tendencies and your ego. It's a battle. It's a sword. And so when Christ says, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He's saying, there is going to be things within our lives that are going to break up when we follow Jesus. You cannot be married to sin. You cannot be married to the world. I want you to imagine when Peter told Jesus, he said, Lord, depart from me from my sinful man. What happened in the story? Peter had followed Jesus at one point. He had left everything, followed Jesus, and then he went back fishing. What did he do? He went back fishing, 
And he was toiling all night and he couldn't catch anything. And Jesus said, hey, Peter, can I use your boat and go out for a catch? And he said, sure, Lord, but we, we toiled all night and we couldn't catch anything. But nevertheless, at your word, I'll obey. And they go out. And Jesus says, throw your, cast your net nets into the deep. And they do. And they catch so much fish. And Peter realizes that there is this battle between him and the presence of Jesus. Right? He's telling Jesus, Lord, like, it's going to be uncomfortable following you. How can I guarantee that I'll be able to provide my, with my family? Like, I know how to be a fisherman. I know how to provide for my family as a fisherman. But if I follow you, you're going to set me against everything that I know. And so what did Peter do when he realized that his life would be blessed with Christ? And that his boat filled with fish and they had to bring another boat. And it was overflowing with fish and both boats began to sink. He said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. I can't be in your presence. I can't be in your presence because I'm a sinner. That is the sword that Jesus came to bring. It is this sword to draw a line between your old life and your new life with Christ. God doesn't want you to have peace with your old life. He wants your old life to be a bygone, to be something old, to be something done with. Today, if Christ were to bring a sword to your life today, what is Jesus going to point that sword at? What is he going to create a hostility between? Maybe it's you and a sinful relationship. He's creating a sword. He's bringing a sword to separate you from that sinful relationship. He does not want you to have peace in this sinful relationship. He doesn't want you to have peace with your own pride. Peace with being able to gossip. And peace with judging others. And peace with your own pride. No, Jesus came to separate us from that. You see, this wasn't a comfortable experience for Peter to see his sins, to know that he rejected Jesus. So he says, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. It didn't bring peace, but it brought a sword. What is Peter telling Jesus? He's basically telling Jesus when he says, depart from me. He's saying, Take your eyes off of me, Jesus. I can't bear my sins in your presence. I have this discomfort. That is the sword. If you felt, tell me if you have felt this sword in your own life before, where you felt that, that something inside of you was saying, no, you can't be with Jesus and have this sin. Have this bad habit. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad drinking habit or a, or a drug addiction or a sexual addiction. Something that, that Christ came to bring a sword. He says, look, like it's, it's either that or me, but we, we can't have, we, we can't be married to this sin. You choose. Do you want God in your life? Then there has to be this sword. You see, but Jesus didn't leave. He stayed with Peter. Even though Peter said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Jesus stayed with him. And what did Peter discover? He described, he discovered a patient Jesus, an indescribable love that he could never have imagined. He discovered acceptance and forgiveness in Christ. You see, Peter discovered so much in Jesus. He discovered so much in Jesus that his old life wasn't ready to accept. Even Jesus says, if they leave you, yeah, I will never forsake you. But what did Peter say? Peter told Peter even at one time, he says, Lord, even if they all deny you, I will never deny you. Right? At the end of his life, at the end before Jesus was crucified, Peter said, if they all leave you, if they all, I will never, I will even die with you. He's saying, Lord, come closer to me. I want to be deeper I want to walk deeper with you. I want to be more connected to you. Do you have this desire in you? This desire to come closer. To take a sword and to destroy the death in your life. You see, David brought that sword. When David fought Goliath and he took a slingshot and threw the stone at Goliath's head and he knocked him out. What did David do? He took a sword. And he beheaded Goliath with his own sword. That's, a, that's symbolism of Christ trampling down death, right? 
Goliath was symbol symbolic of death by death, that sword. So he took Goliath's weapon, which was death, which was the sword, and he destroyed him by it. You see, Christ came to bring a sword to destroy the death in your life. To not have peace with the different experience of death that you might be feeling regularly. Let's be honest. Are you feeling death in your life? Feeling darkness? Feel Christ came to separate you from that. He came to bring a sword. You see, sometimes Christ, in coming to our lives and accepting Him, believe it or not, things are going to fall apart in your life. The things that you have made peace with that are against the will of God, God is going to allow things to fall apart. And I know this is not the attractive side of my sermon right now. You're saying, no, no, okay, then, then I might have to take a step back because I don't want things to fall apart in my life. But sometimes Jesus needs to tear down things before he rebuilds. Maybe Jesus needs to tear down something in your life. So he comes to bring a sword, not peace. He does not want you to have peace with things in your life that are, that are worldly, things that are sinful. Why? Because Christ wants to rebuild. He wants to reconstruct our lives in Him and Him being our foundation, Him being the chief cornerstone. But I cannot build my life on something else. So what does Christ do? He brings a sword to destroy those things and you will experience it for a short time. For a short time as Christ is destroying these things in our life as we invite Him into our life. As Christ has come, I'm going to admit, there will be some t turmoil for a time. There, there's going to be things that are going to be difficult, things that are going to be hard. When you hear the words, follow me, when Jesus says, follow me, you automatically think, if I follow Jesus, I will feel peace and joy in Christ. But following Jesus isn't always comfortable. It isn't always an easy experience, but Christ says, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke or take my load, take my burden upon you. Christ is saying that there is a yoke. There is a yoke to be carried. The Lord is going to disturb all the false peace that is in your life. How many of us have deceived ourselves thinking that I have peace and my life is good? Sometimes people, I know their lives are in shambles. and They come and they don't want to admit that, that, that they're living a wrong lifestyle. And they don't want to admit that because they don't plan on changing these things. That they have a false peace in their life. And they come, no, but I'm fine. I feel content. I feel joy. I feel... No, you don't. Be honest. And there's nothing worse than when the person eventually, their, their life breaks down because that's what sin does, right? Sin, sin destroys our lives. And they come back, and I'm like, remember how you were trying to tell me how everything was perfect? Why did you do that? You made a false peace with yourself. Breaks my heart. I'm not going to insist that somebody's empty when they're telling me that they're full, that their life is empty. I can't say, no, no, you're lost. And you, you, you don't know what life is all about. I can't do that. And so I let them say what they got to say, but it's not the truth. It is a false peace. Be careful. If there's something that you are tolerating in your life that Christ would never tolerate. Christ has come to bring a sword. He did not come to bring peace but a sword. He has to destroy our pride, our selfishness. The corruption in our mind. There's things in our minds, the, our way of thinking that is wrong. He came to bring peace. I'm sorry, he came to bring a sword against a certain way of thinking. Maybe your false value system of, of material comfort, thinking that material comfort is the way to, to peace and joy. And maybe Christ disturbs that, knowing that as long as you love the world, the Bible says, for whoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So what does the Lord do? He comes to bring a sword against those worldly things in our life. I know what you're thinking. I don't want that. I don't want Jesus' sword. Believe me, that false peace is the sword of the devil. It is the sword of the devil that is coming to hurt your life. So Christ came to bring a different sword to destroy that enemy that, that is fighting against your life. 
First comes the sword, then comes peace. First comes the sword of Jesus to break up this turmoil, to create a hostility between us and sin and us and the world and us and our emptiness, us and, our, and the, the enemy, the devil himself. He brings that sword, but then he brings peace. So Then he brings peace. And that's why God tolerates suffering. Let's look at what St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn with me. If you have your Bible, look with me. This is a beautiful, and I tell you guys this every week. It's a golden chapter. This is a golden chapter. Every chapter in the Bible is a golden chapter, but this is especially one. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is St. Paul, after he had had many revelations, and he had seen the Lord, and he'd seen heaven, Let's read what it says. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. So we're reading 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So here we have God has given St. Paul a thorn in his flesh. Lest... He'd be exalted above it unless he become very proud and very proud that he's seeing visions of heaven and revelations and he got to see paradise, all these amazing things. So God gave him what? A thorn in the flesh, some type of ailment or sickness or, or, or physical challenge. So what? He says, lest I be exalted above measure so I don't get pride. That's a sword. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord, I begged the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so what does Christ do? Christ brings his sword to slay those things that you rely on. Those things that you become dependent on away from Jesus. Those things that have made you substitute Christ for some worldly thing, some worldly comfort or, or, or money or, or your people around you, or even your own family, Christ wants you to depend on Him, that you would put your faith in Him. So that's where Christ comes to bring the sword. And he says, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. You don't need money. You don't need this. You don't need that. What you need is my grace. Are you hunting for that grace? Do you have peace? with relying on everything else and your own power and your own ability to control your own life. Do you have peace with that? I'm telling you now that Christ will have to bring the sword. Why? Because you need to learn to depend on Jesus. Once again, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Listen to what St. Paul says. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, my sicknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, St. Paul discovered, he says, I boast in my infirmities. I boast in my weaknesses because that's when I experience the power. That when Christ comes with his sword to give me infirm, to allow me to have sicknesses or weaknesses or trials or whatever they may be, I will discover Christ's power rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. He welcomes, St. Paul's welcoming the sword of Christ. I take pleasure in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Are you willing to accept the sword of Jesus? Because when you're weak, when he comes to slay those things that you are depending on, then you're going to be strong. You see, he wants to mold us as we said in the beginning, and restore His image in us. Christ's image, His nature in you that, that is supposed to be apparent on all of His believers, this love and gentleness and purity and, and covering other people's sins and, and not judging, this nature of Jesus, okay? God wants to mold that in us. He wants to restore it in us. But as long as it's you and your selfishness and your own sinful nature... He can't. So what does he do? He brings a sword. It's not a real sword, but a true spiritual sword that separates the false from the true. The sword that brings us face to face with our sins. 
then he also comes to bring the sword against evil against injustice the, the injustices or oppression against demonic forces Christ came to bring a sword against all that is unjust all that is not fair anybody that is mistreated or oppressed or falsely accused Christ came to bring a, a sword against that to fight the devil the gates of Hades what does the Bible say the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church once again the gates of Hades, Bab al Gahim, okay, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. I think people don't understand this verse. When you think of gates not prevailing, you see, gates are used to keep people out. And so he's saying the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against the church. The church is coming to break down the gates of hell. To break it down. And those gates will not be able to keep the church out. The church will come with a sword to destroy the gates of Hades. To destroy the gates of hell. And the gates of Hades and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Don't you want that power in your life? That the devil can never prevail against you? What kind of injustices? Is Christ coming to bring the sword when, when, you know, I brought this up several times, this, this slave project where there's um, Islamic militants that, that have taken thousands and thousands of slaves in, in Sudan or in Africa, have made them slave, sex slavery. We have a ministry here affiliated with St. Mark's called Leave the Jar and they are fighting against sex trafficking, taking kids that have been kidnapped from their homes and their families and are used and abused in, in terrible ways. No, the church came to bring a sword, not to go kill the bad guys, but to convert, to change, to work against all these wicked things in the world. Are you ready to bring up that sword of Christ? Christ came to bring the sword, and he wants you to use the sword. Don't misunderstand. We are not the religion of the sword. I'm not talking about a physical sword of shedding blood. It is a spiritual sword. It is a sword that the enemy can never overcome. That when we find that Christians are going and doing work that is setting people free, that is delivering people, that is doing mighty work for the kingdom of God, that is the sword that Jesus came to bring. It is a sword against evil. And this is why he tells you and me, put on the whole armor of God. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Beautiful chapter. Golden chapter again. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Anybody want to fight with the spiritual hosts of wickedness? Not without the sword of Jesus. And so when Christ came to bring the sword, I'm saying, Lord, bring me that sword. I need that sword to fight against the spiritual hosts of wickedness. I pray that we can truly be able to, to bring this sword. What else? If you're angry or hostile, be hostile towards your brother, or sorry, towards the devil, not your brother. I often tell this to people who are fighting in their marriages. They're mad at their wife, or they're mad at their husband, and they're fighting against their, their, their spouses, and there's like a war in the house. I'm like, man, you brought the sword against the wrong person. Your enemy is not your spouse. Your enemy is not your wife or your husband. Your enemy is the devil. You bring the sword of Christ against the devil. Don't make peace with the concept of divorce. Don't make peace with the concept of separation. That's why Christ says, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. My spouse is not my enemy. 
The devil is my enemy. And I'm going to fight the enemy that is destroying my marriage with humility, with love, with repentance, with asking for forgiveness, with accepting my spouse's apology, with restoring my marriage. That is the sword that Christ came to bring. The sword of righteous anger. Something called righteous anger. When righteous anger is controlled, it's directed against the devil. That's what we do with outreach, with missionary work. I always say this, when we go into missionary work and we go to preach in a foreign land or some place, we are going to put the flag of Jesus in a place that the devil has made his own territory. I love on these missionary trips, I tell the people in, in th th that I'm serving, I say, look, we're going to go. We are going to go take the flag of Jesus and go into enemy territory. We're going to put the flag of Jesus in that land and say, this land is for Jesus. Right? And so we need that righteous anger. That righteous anger directed against evil. When we go on outreach, we outreach our, our, our loved ones or people within our church, people that are lost, people that are in the world, we outreach them and we bring them to Christ. That is the sword. The sword that says, I will not allow the devil to swallow the life of my brother. It's anger. Anger can be a weapon in the arsenal of all the Christian powers that you've been given. If, are you angry at something? Use the power of Christ to defeat evil. Let your anger fuel a fire in you to serve, to save people that are being stolen by, by, by the devil and by sin and by the world. Use that anger to fuel a fire within you. Maybe to cure cancer. You lost a loved one to, to coronavirus or to, to, to cancer. Use that anger within you to fight against cancer to fundraise and to, 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 to do research, do all these things to fight against the evils in our world. Imagine 700 million people in our world. Seven, I'm going to repeat it again. 700 million people in our world sleep hungry every night. That is 9% of the world is sleeping hungry. Does that make you angry? Bring a sword against anger. Bring a sword against anger and feed the hungry. Say, Lord, give me, give me strength for this fight. I'm going to read a story that I loved, that I, I want to end with. And I thought it was a, a beautiful story that I, I think will really bring home the message. Listen to it with me. In the sayings of the Desert Fathers, it is said of a certain monk named John that he prayed God to take his passions away from him so that he might become free from care. He told his spiritual advisor, I find myself in peace without an enemy. I, I think my life is easy. I don't have an enemy. I feel good. My life is easy. So the spiritual counselor replied, Go, beseech God to stir up warfare so that you may regain the affliction and humility that you used to have. Imagine when he says, you know that easy life that you're living? Maybe it's keeping you from being humble. It's keeping you from being broken in, in the spirit of repentance and worship to the Lord. Go beseech God to stir up warfare so that, you, so that you may regain the affliction and humility that you used to have. For it is by warfare that the soul makes progress. He says, through warfare, it is through this sword that Christ comes to bring that your soul grows, that becomes to know Jesus more, but not the easy life. So he besought God, and when suffering returned, he no longer prayed that it might be taken away, but said, Lord, give me strength for the fight. When you have some difficult time in your life, you don't say, Lord, remove it. You say, Lord, give me strength for the fight. I need this war. I need this sword to get rid of the sin in my life and the things that are causing destruction in my life. It is through the sword of suffering that we learn humility and dependence on God. For it is our weakness that we discover God's great power. Use the sword against one's own sin.
use the sword against one own sin. I pray that we would truly ask Christ who came not to bring peace, but to bring a sword upon the earth. Can you imagine that today you will be asking for Christ's sword, not his peace? I don't want the peace with sin. I don't want peace with evil. I don't want to have peace with injustice and social injustice and oppression and, and evil and darkness. I don't want to make peace with that. I want to have a sword and I want to go against it. Let's end in a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen, our dear Heavenly Father. Lord, you did not come to bring peace, but a sword. To set a, 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 to set a man against his father. To set a daughter against her mother. Lord, not because you want a division, but you want us to be set apart. You want to break up those things that, that, that allow darkness to, to come into our life and into our world. Lord, we're praying that you would create in us an anger against sin, that there would be a sword to separate us from the love of our own flesh and indulgence. Bring that sword, Lord, to, to divide us from fellowship with darkness and sin. For nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ, Lord. Lord, we're asking for this inner hostility, this inner turmoil, to make us, Lord, feel uncomfortable with, with the ways of sin and the ways of the world. We're asking you, Lord, for this sword to bring division, that we would never feel in unity with, with, with a false, with a false truth, with a false peace, Lord. We pray this all in your holy and precious name through sessions of St. Mary and St. Mark and all the saints, with the blessings of this Advent fast, make us worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil. And through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you all.